I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We are a husband and wife team running a wildlife education nonprofit. It's focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is a collaboration with EarthX here in Dallas, Texas. EarthX is the largest Earth Day celebration in the world, and it brings in speakers from every corner of the environmental arena. Listen in to hear the stories of today's environmental titans, covering everything from environmental law, ocean health, renewable energy, clean transportation, and so much more. Let's get to the show. Welcome to this episode of Conservation Connection. We are here at EarthX Dallas 2019, and I am so excited to be sitting across from David Yarnold. David is the president and CEO of Audubon, and we're so excited to have you on the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Sarah Catherine and Chance. I appreciate the chance to be here on uh, Conservation Connection. We're so happy to have you here, and thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. So I know that you've got something really cool happening with colleges. Can you tell me a little bit more about this initiative? Yeah, so we launched a college chapter program this year. There are 20 colleges, including junior colleges, that have chapters. We have 30 more in the pipeline. We should have 50 by the fall. We should have 150 by the fall of 2020. It's just taken off on its own, and and these college chapters are bonding with their local Audubon chapters, which surprises me. Um, (laughs) But they're doing great work. They're learning about birds, and they're doing political activism. So what is the goal of the chapter? Is it to teach up-and-coming conservationists about the bird life around them? Is it to get them involved in policy? What is it? Yeah, so uh, it'll differ uh, school to school, but broadly, it's about helping people understand the relationship of birds to ecosystems and to take action on behalf of those ecosystems. And whether that's around climate change, renewable energy, uh, coastal restoration, depends a little bit on where the school is and what the geography looks like. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be about activism. It's new, and the college chapters are making it up as they go along, which is actually pretty fabulous. That's a pretty good way to do it because that's authentic. It got born in a really authentic way. We were at the Audubon convention two years ago in Park City, and I said during my big plenary address, we're thinking about launching college chapters, and then during the Q&A, these two young women, one was a junior, that was a sophomore from UNC Greensboro, said, well, we've already done that. And I said, great, how does it work? (laughs) <laughs> and so, so they told me how it worked. And then a bunch of them got together around the pool later that day and our college chapter program was born. And now you're going to have 150, you said? by We hope to have 150 by, by 2020. By this fall, we should have 50. They're already in the pipeline. The hardest part is just getting the, the advisors and all that put together. But once they're up and running, I think they're going to be uh, really powerful. We already have 463 Audubon chapters. We are local everywhere in the U.S. And that's one of the things that makes Audubon different is that we're everybody's neighbor. We have deep roots in red states and purple states and blue states. And so when we come to issues, we do it really authentically. We do it out of a concern for the place where we live, not a place where we're visiting. And the truth is that Audubon is one of the true pillars of conservation and has always been on the forefront of describing the natural world in a way that it inspires people to protect it. That's true. It started with a group of women who formed the first Audubon chapters to prevent the slaughter of birds for hats. So there was a time around the turn of the 20th century where an ounce of egret feathers was worth more than an ounce of gold. Wow. And these women got legislation passed in 1918. It's called the Migratory Bird Act that protects birds from being killed either accidentally or on purpose unless there were permits in place. Unfortunately, that law is under attack right now, um, and we're working really hard to defend it, and our college chapters are a part of that activism as well. 
So with these college chapters, where do you hope to see them in five or 10 years down the road? And also, are these chapters going to have alumni or how will that work? Because of course, if you're in this chapter, I'm sure you want to stay involved. But after you graduate from college, do they have a way to stay involved? Since they're just starting, we don't have an alumni network yet. Right. Um, but I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of tools and that are going to help us create that network. And we've talked about doing that. So we'll have a place where people can keep in touch with each other and and where we can keep in touch with them. Because, you know, we hope what we're helping to do here is not just provide really great experiences for people, but that we're creating a new generation of conservation leaders. Whether they work at Audubon or somewhere else, I don't really care. But what I'm hoping we're doing is creating a diverse new generation of leaders for the conservation movement. Fantastic. So I want to shift gears a little bit here. Audubon does so many things in so many different ways. What are the biggest threats to migratory birds today? And what are some of the ways that Audubon is working to mitigate those threats? So the biggest threat to birds is the biggest threat to the planet, which is climate change. Birds are seeing their food sources disappear. They're seeing the places they need fragment or dry up, or in the case of coasts, slip away into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're seeing forest canopy in Latin America being cut down, coastlines being developed for, you know, resort communities or, or whatever. But climate change ultimately is the greatest threat to birds. We did a study a few years ago that looked at the underlying climate variables and bird population trends. And what it said was actually pretty straightforward. And what it said was that by 2080, nearly half of America's species, 314 species, could lose more than 50% of their range. Is extinction likely for some of those species? Yeah, probably. That's the bad news. The good news is there's a lot we can do about that. We can do two things. Number one is we can protect the places birds need now and are going to need in the future. And two is that we can address the underlying causes of climate change. So you can actually see the future for all 314 of those birds represented as animated GIFs on our website on audubon.org in our birds and climate report. So whether you click on a wood thrush or a common loon or a golden eagle or a bald eagle, you can see what's going to happen to the range of those birds. You can see that there aren't going to be bald eagles in the lower 48 by the end of the century. You can see that you're not going to be able to hear a loon on a lake in Minnesota in the summer by the end of the century. So one of the things about birds that makes them so compelling, and I was not a birder before I came to Audubon nine years ago, so this is all relatively new knowledge. Um, one of the things that is truly remarkable about birds is that people take them personally. If you ask somebody from Minnesota, have you heard a loon? They'll say, well, sure. And then if you ask them, can you remember where you were when you heard that loon? They'll say, yes. And then if you ask them, can you remember if you were with somebody that you love when you heard that loon? They'll tell you who it was. And making climate change personal that way is one of the ways that we're going to get a lot of people to take action on behalf of birds. What a great hook to get people to really be invested in these issues, to tie them to something that truly is intrinsically, personally important to them. Yeah. So I, I worked in my previous job at Environmental Defense Fund uh, on climate legislation in 2008 and 2009, and we convinced the House of Representatives that we needed to put a price on carbon and reduce emissions. The problem was there was only one thing missing for those elected representatives, and that was about 50 million beating hearts. They were going home to their districts, and there were no grassroots. But that's what Audubon is. That's what Audubon does. That's why it matters that Audubon is local everywhere, because we're going to put a lot of butts in seats so that when representatives come home, they're going to see T-shirts that say, what about my loons? Yeah. Absolutely. We've really hit some great points in this episode, and we're really appreciative of you coming and speaking with us today. A question on both of our minds and maybe on some of our listeners' minds. Being with Audubon, do you have a favorite bird? <laughs> it's a little like asking me if I have a favorite kid. 
<laughs> so so then maybe so, not a favorite. Just name some of your top. So it I sort it sort of changes. Yeah. Right. It changes from time to time. So over, over the last year, my two favorites have been uh, the roseate spoonbill because who doesn't like a pink bird with a long, weirdly <laughs> shaped nose? Sure. Um, and a purple gallinule. Purple gallinule looks like it's wearing a costume. Long yellow legs. It can walk on lily pads. It's like 20, 30 different colors. Um, and it lives in hot, wet places down in the south. It's a really awesome bird. If you've never seen one, they're absolutely incredible. Google it right now. Like, pause the podcast, Google it, and then come back because they're just gorgeous animals. Yeah, they really are. That was a fantastic answer. Those are <laughs> there were two really excellent charismatic birds to end on. Too. Yeah. Everybody loves the colorful ones. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate this discussion of what Audubon is doing to help protect the environment. And we really hope that we get to work with Audubon more in the future. Great. So you can go to www.audubon.org. You'll see the, our five strategic priorities. There are lots of ways to take action. Everything from putting native plants on your patio or your backyard and creating a sanctuary in your own yard to being in touch with your legislator about the birds that you love. And if you're listening, scroll down to the show notes. We're going to put those links right there so you guys can click on them and I'll take you right there. And the first one is going to be a picture of a purple gallinule. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chance. Thanks, Sarah Catherine. Thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We would love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. We'll post bonus content that addresses your questions and gives you a little more information. A big thanks to EarthX for hosting us, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week. Bye.